Hi. Is this better? Yeah, yeah, that's better. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You were uh, blurring and I, maybe it was a weak connection. It was a weak connection. I put it on a better connection. Well, I must apologize. This is very uncharacteristic of me to be so uh, like this. I'm trying to fit you in uh, in the middle of a, an extraordinarily stressful move. And it's not your fault at all. It's my fault entirely. But I'm trying very hard to, to get you in because I really want to highlight your book. And uh, sometimes yeah, I no take on too Sometimes I take on too much stuff and it's... Uh, yeah, and hey, no worries at all. No worries at all. I appreciate you fitting me in. Thanks, David. It's uh, really nice to meet you. You're obviously a legend in my field. And so it's uh, pretty pretty much an honor to uh, talk to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, 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 legend, uh, 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 loved by some, hated by others. So <laughs> perhaps... Uh, well, we can, talk about, we can talk about that. You know, and it's funny. It's, it's not like anyone... Like, it's not like people hate you personally. It's yeah. so funny how we as like a, uh, well, maybe some do. I don't know about that. But I'm saying yeah. in terms of evolutionary psychology, it's like, it's like you're a symbol of, so it's funny how people can hate a, an individual because they become a symbol for someone of something. Right. It's fascinating how that happens. Well, I can, I'm ready to jump in if you're ready. Yep, I am ready. Today it's, um, today, it's great to have David Buss on the podcast. David is a professor of psychology at University of Texas, Austin, and is one of the founders of the field of evolutionary psychology. His primary research focus is on strategies of human mating, particularly the dark side of human mating nature, including conflict between the sexes, jealousy, stalking, intimate partner violence, and murder. Basically the greatest hits of uh, the dark side. <laughs> David is author of a number of books on mating, including The Evolution of Desire, and most recently, Why Men Behave Badly, The Hidden Roots of Sexual Deception, Harassment, and Assault. David, great to chat with you today. Thank you. Glad to be here and chatting with you. So I want to start off by asking you, what is mating? It sounds like a very nerdy term for sex. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, when I first started studying the topic... Um, it was the only term that was sufficiently broad to capture uh, the, the diverse phenomena that I was interested in. And in fact, sex is only really one, one part of it, um, uh, an important part, of course, uh, but it's only one part. And actually, when I first started getting into it, this is a little bit of note of historical background, uh, I, and I started studying uh, dating couples and married couples, uh, I actually thought it would be too intrusive to ask them about their sex lives. Mm -hmm. And so I actually didn't. I, I, uh, I asked them about everything. I was studying everything around sex. So the mate selection process, what qualities people want in a mate, uh, tactics of attraction, tactics of mate retention. Uh, but what happened was in these early studies, as I interviewed the couples, they said, um, you've asked us about everything under the sun, but you haven't asked us about our sex lives. And I had thought it would be too intrusive. And so over time, I started getting more and more into uh, the domain of sexuality per se. Uh, but of course, still uh, a lot of what I study is not, doesn't have to do with sex per se, but everything around it. That's fair so, enough. Yeah. So meaning is a broad domain. It's very, very broad yeah. domain. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, and it includes all those things from, you know, uh, jumping into the mating pool tactics of attraction, attracting a mate, all the things that go on in a relationship, uh, including sexual stuff, and then also getting rid of a mate, uh, mate ejection tactics, mate guarding tactics, uh, jumping back into the mating pool after you've uh, been out of a relationship. So, uh, so there, there's a lot of interesting human phenomena, uh, in particular because among, with humans we have long-term mating as one of our strategies. Uh, we don't just, I mean, many species, they just do essentially short-term mating. Like even chimpanzees, our closest primate relative, uh, female comes into estrus, uh, they, there's sex that occurs during that period, and then the sexes are pretty indifferent to each other after that. Uh, whereas in our species, we sometimes engage in more prolonged mating that can last um, a week, a month, a year, a decade, a lifetime. Yeah, it's a very central part of the human experience, isn't it? Uh, I would say so. I would yeah. say, I, in that sense, I lucked out uh, by picking this topic. And even after many years of studying 
these different aspects of mating, I thought, you know, I really want to branch out and study other things. And so I started studying homicide, why people kill other people. And it turns out most of the motives for murder are related either directly or indirectly to mating. And so uh, what I sometimes say is you, could, you can run, but you can't hide from mating. It, it permeates so many facets of our, of our lives. Yeah, for good and bad. Yeah. So why... You know, why did you go into the field of evolutionary psychology or even you know, you're one of the founders of it? Like, take me back to the, uh, the years preceding evolutionary psychology. What were you interested in and how did that morph into this new field? Well, well, that's 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 a big question. So I have to give you a short answer. Uh, give me a uh, short see, answer. Yeah. See that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there when I first got into the field of psychology, there was no evolutionary psychology, as you as you just mentioned. Um, but what I was interested in was, was a solid theory of human nature. That is, you know, what, what motivates people? What gets people out of bed in the morning? What makes people tick? Why do they strive toward the goals toward which they strive? Um, and so I got into the field of personality psychology, which I thought was the closest to, you know, developing or attempting to develop grand theories of human nature. Uh, which they did. Uh, but when I got into that, what I realized is that they, uh, so different theories made certain intuitive, had certain tu intuitive appeal to them, or certain facets did, you know, Rogers, uh, Freud, yeah. uh, Jung, Maslow, etc. Uh, but that they all lacked a solid scientific foundation. That is, mm -hmm. if you ask the question, well, why should we go with this theorist versus that theorist. And so it was my search for a solid scientific foundation that ultimately led me to evolutionary theory, which is a theory about the causal origins of whatever mechanisms of mind that we have that are housed in our brain uh, and to some degree in our bodies. Uh, and so uh, uh, identifying the causal origins of whatever mechanisms we have uh, it was was absolutely critical. and. I think it's, um, you know, it's been one of the things that historically has been absent from the field of psychology, um, uh, the causal origins of, and importantly, the functions of whatever psychological mechanisms we have. And it was, uh, I remember uh, that this is probably before you were born, but uh, it was viewed as unscientific to even pose the question, what is the function of X or Y psychological mechanisms? And uh, and I think it had to do with um, uh, uh, inadequate theoretical clarity on what the term function meant. And within evolutionary theory, there is a very precise meaning of the term function. That is, uh, that is, what adaptive problem is this psychological mechanism designed to solve? You know, and and ultimately, all mechanisms are tributary to survival or reproduction, reproduction being the more important one. Um, uh, but they're uh, long and circuitous routes to get there. So for example, mm. you know, humans have, uh, it's been posited, and I think it's reasonable that humans have motives to get ahead in status hierarchies. We evolved in small group living. Uh, all groups contain status hierarchies. Position in the status hierarchy is uh, linked to access to reproductively relevant resources. And so it's reasonable that humans would have a motivation to uh, get ahead, to maintain their position, to fight off rivals who are vying for the same position and so forth. Uh, but uh, you could say, well, what does that have to do with survival and reproduction? Well, as it turns out that getting ahead in status hierarchy hierarchies does lead to uh, preferential access to more desirable mates uh, and to more mates if you if you have them. And, and even in terms of survival, uh, like in the Aceh of Paraguay, for example, a small hunter-gatherer group that Kim Hill has studied extensively, the um, people in the group give better health care to the children of the high-status males. So as they pick the thorns out of their feet, they are very solicitous of, and so even in terms of uh, survival status translates into uh, into greater survival. So the key point that I was making here is that an evolu evolutionary theory provides a precise 
uh, definition of what we mean when we say is this functional. And and just to make one last point on this, I realize I'm rambling a little bit. Oh, that's um, great. Is is that in the field of psychology, Scott? As I as I think you're probably aware, the term function or adaptive is used. It has been used and is used very loosely in the field. So if you read like, I don't know, social psychology, so the, the, it's adaptive to do X or it's adaptive to have high self-esteem uh, or it's uh, functional or dysfunctional. And really what many of these are, are kind of in, informal, intuitive appeals to what people feel is bad rather than a precise, clear definition of what we mean by adaptive, uh, or what we mean by the evolved proper function from an evolutionary perspective. So your point is very well taken. Um, a lot of, uh, well, some evolutionary biologists, as well as others, have criticized the field of evolutionary psychology as not being up to the rigorous standards of evolutionary biology, for instance. Um, some have criticized um, the uh, the st- they call it just so stories. What I wanted to ask you is what are what are some criticisms of the field of evolutionary psychology that you think the critics get right and, and which ones do you think they, they really get wrong? Um, well, I think they get most of them wrong. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, but uh, what I would say is uh, like any like any discipline, um, there are good practitioners and bad practitioners. There's the whole range of quality of um uh, scientific research done in the field. And uh, is there bad work in evolutionary psychology? Absolutely. Uh, Is there good work? Absolutely. Is there good and bad work in cognitive psychology and cognitive science and social psychology? Yeah, there you see the whole spectrum there. And and I think evolutionary psychology is no different in that respect. Um, uh, The field of evolutionary psychology, uh, it's kind of ironic that you mentioned evolutionary biologists uh, Many practitioners of evolutionary psychology, indeed many of the founders, are evolutionary biologists. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first uh, president of the Human Behavior and Evolution Society was uh, W.D. Hamilton, the founder of inclusive fitness theory, uh, one of the most important, if not the most important, evolutionary biologists of the last of the of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Uh, Also, uh, George C. Williams uh, of uh, uh, Richard Alexander, uh, Richard Dawkins. There are many uh, prominent evolutionary biologists who are evolutionary psychologists and are uh, basically supporters of the field. Um, you know, the the just so story uh, issue is uh, is a, in my view, a kind of, um, in some ways, a, a silly meme, and but in some ways has forced the field to be clearer. Uh, so, uh, so the notion that, um, I mean, this is a, a term that was coined by Stephen Jay Gould, m- you know, many, many decades ago, and, um, it was used actually in his case, not to criticize evolutionary psychology, but the field of evolutionary biology. Uh, and I think that the criticism uh, that, that you just sit around and come up with some cocktail party speculation, uh, of course people do that, but that's not what gets into the scientific journals. So uh, it's not what gets into uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Science. So we just published an article on status there. Uh, And if I sent an article and said, oh, I was sitting around uh, having drinks with colleagues and I offered this speculation, I'd like to publish it at PNAS, uh, they they would, of course, laugh me out. It would get desk rejected. Uh, So uh, the the game is is really a pure science game. You know, does the theory lead to precise predictions that have not yet been tested. You go out and you do the work and you test them and they're either confirmed or uh, not confirmed or some say falsified. Uh, And then across multiple studies, you examine the weight of the evidence. Um, And in fact, the field of evolutionary psychology, and I would say mating has really been a success story of the field of evolutionary psychology in the sense that it has had not only um, uh, predictive value that a specific evolutionary hypothesis have led to novel discoveries about our mating mind that we didn't know about before, but it also has an important quality, uh, namely heuristic value. That is, it guides researchers to important domains of inquiry that 
um, no other theoretical framework or perspective leads you to those domains. And so it's uncovered things like the importance of um, genetic relatedness on altruism and helping behavior. It's led to the discovery of um, uh, just uh, uh, why women engage in short-term mating. So something that, that I've studied, uh, you know, which is kind of a, has been a puzzle, an evolutionary puzzle. And, um, and, so, uh, and so it has those qualities, predictive and, and heuristic value, again, with the qualification that they're good and, and bad practitioners, uh, as in every field. Hey everyone, I'm excited to announce that the eight-week online Transcend course is back. This iteration of the course, which will run from September 5th to October 24th of this year, will use science to help you live a more fulfilling, meaningful, creative, and self-actualized life. There will be limited slots available, so save your spot as soon as possible. In addition to the regular class pricing, we're also offering limited slots for personal self-actualization coaching. Save your spot today by going to transcendcourse.com. That's transcendcourse.com. The Transcend course is just one of the offerings of the brand new Center for the Science of Human Potential. The Center for the Science of Human Potential's mission is to use science to help each person fulfill their highest potential and contribute to the good of society. Toward that goal, we offer classes, coaching, and consulting opportunities to help people apply the latest science to help themselves, their organizations, their schools, their families, and their communities to be more creative, loving, and full of transcendent possibilities. For more on the center, you can go to scienceofhumanpotential.com. Hey everyone, doing this podcast for y'all is one of my greatest privileges, but the cost of maintaining a professional production like this one really adds up. I'm grateful to today's sponsors who help fund the show, but if you'd prefer a completely ad-free experience, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. You'll get completely ad-free episodes all while directly supporting the show for as little as $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash psych podcast. Yeah, there, uh, yes, that's, that's a very fair point. Um, um, you know, sometimes, uh, the media will, uh, will highlight a really shoddy evolutionary psychology study that legitimately does tell a just so story to explain some study that was found among 40 uh, college sophomores. And right. then it says, now we have a theory of, of human male meeting behavior. Well, sophomore men, I'll tell you, are not <laughs> necessarily generalizable right. to right. all of male human nature, but, um, and, but they'll blow that up and they'll say, you know, see the field of evolutionary psychology right. is junk. Yeah. Right. Right. So, but I mean, you could level that, you could do the same thing in every field, like any, phenomenon in the field of social psychology or mm. cognitive science, you could say, you know, look at this, you know, uh, I mean, in many cases in the field of social psychology, there really isn't what I would consider a proper theory behind it, you know, and, and as you know, I know you've, I've listened to several of your really fascinating podcasts and you've talked about the replication crisis mm -hmm. issue and, um, you know, and phenomena that get are splashy and get a lot of attention, but turn out, um, not to be real phenomena, uh, and, but, but often there was never any cogent theory behind those phenomena anyway. So, you know, um, and, and I, I think, you know, uh, a suite of things that we've, that I'm referring to, cause you've talked about them on your po previous podcasts. Absolutely. Although I would say that the field that seems to have shown the least, uh, replication, uh, failures is the, is my field of personality psychology. And I'm not, I'm only saying that, you know, um, uh, not to say that it's perfect, but I would be very surprised if we find someday, Oh, look, it, it turns out that introverts don't exist. You know, we didn't replicate that or like, you yeah. know, like, or that there is no personality variation in terms of, uh, neuroticism, you know, like, right. uh, yeah. oops, we failed to replicate. There's something about the field of personal psychology, which is, is more replicable because it looks um, at, you know, reliability over time. I mean, that's right. built that's built into the measure. Social right. psychology is like, you know, to hold this cup. Does this person feel more warmth, you know, like in right. the, and then right. we'll say, well, this is always going to be the case. Well, that's that's riskier. <laughs> it's riskier. Yeah. 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 And 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 yeah. And and, and the more counterintuitive, which has been, you know, one of the favored 
tendency in the, in the field of social psychology, the more counterintuitive, the more Im important it seems and more flashy. It's like your grandmother couldn't have told you this. And it's it seems like it's those counterintuitive things that seem the least replicable. Mm. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I was as, as you know, I was trained, as I mentioned, I was trained in personality psychology also. And there uh, I, I would say the domain of mating and 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 uh, in particular, the work that has been most influential of mine, I've been very happy with how replicable it is. So it is even mm. people who don't like the the theory and who don't like, say, the discovery of sex differences, they're still able to replicate the the uh, results in their laboratories. And so um, sex differences in mate preferences, uh, sexual jealousy, predictors of mate retention tactics, uh, even some recent stuff. So there, there are uh, there, there's a group of evolutionary psychologists that ha have devoted their labs to replicating and uh, phenomena, and and in some cases they're not replicable. Uh, but um, but I've been very pleasantly surprised that the findings coming out of my lab uh, are. So uh, you know it's that's, and I mean it's something I train my students on. I, I don't know if you train your students on, on this, but is like you don't want to you don't want to go for the short term game. You know, because yeah. ultimately, if you do some study and then turn, you know, so so what I've always done, I was trained at Berkeley, which was very much of an empirical tradition where that was theory didn't matter at all. What you wanted was solid empirical findings. And so and so that was kind of core to my training. And I want to do enough studies so that I am confident of the results of those studies before I publish. You know, and that's why, like, when I one of my most well-known studies, the 37 culture study, I wanted to do it in as many cultures as I possibly could. I didn't want to do it on 40 college sophomores, um, you know, because I knew no one would believe it. Uh, yeah. And I, I wanted to, to assure that it was solid in my mind uh, before putting it out there in the public domain. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when I look at that research also, sometimes I, uh, I look at David Schmidt's research um, yeah. and I look and see just the uh, the broad, expansive nature of it and the, and, and the attempt to replicate it. Uh, maybe uh, evolution psychologists are held to a higher standard sometimes unfairly, perhaps, or maybe fairly uh, because the stakes might be higher in terms of the topics that are studied and the implications of them. I don't know, but it does seem like sometimes, you know, it's like you can <laughs> you can do a study where you replicate something in like virtually every culture on the earth and basically almost every human. And then people are like, that's a just so story. <laughs> you know, right, It's like, right, what else right. do you want from us? Are you doing that? Anyway, I'm being a little bit cheeky, but do you see my point? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely do see your point. I mean, I'm perfectly fine with evolutionary psychology being held to a higher standard. Mm. Um, I mean, I think all fields should be held to high standards, but I'm perfectly fine with that. And I think that uh, partly as a result of the criticism that is generated, it has forced people to uh, adhere to a higher standard, at least in in, in many cases. So, uh, so, so I'm I'm quite comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other sort of related thing uh, is that sometimes it, it's not just the theory. Sometimes people don't like the findings, uh, right. and so uh, for and, and and I don't either. You know, so for example, the you know the fact that men tend to prioritize physical appearance and physical attractiveness uh, in in mating more than women do, although women do as well, and that women prioritize resource acquisition abilities. Um, I don't necessarily like that finding. I don't like the finding that, that there are sex differences in desire for sexual variety, uh, which actually gets us into the, the, the new book. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it would be nice if the sexes were identical on average in their desire for sexual variety, how many partners you want, uh, amount of investment prior to sex, et cetera. Uh, so the findings coming out are not necessarily findings that I like, which is sometimes what people think. They think that if you find something that somehow you think that it, you're endorsing it or you think it's a good thing or morally um, respectable um, or some kind of view that you're trying to promulgate, um, which, is, which is simply not the case. I mean, if that's the case, I'm in trouble because, I mean, I've studied uh, sexual harassment, sexual coercion, 
uh, murder, stalking, and everything, if I thought these things were good, mm. um, well, I never would have written the book. <laughs> I mean, I yeah, uh, studied yeah. these things because I, I, precisely the opposite. I think that they're, uh, they're, they're ills, sexual violence toward women, broadly speaking, uh, is, is a, uh, a horrible problem that's worldwide. I actually view it as the most widespread human rights violation, period, um, you know, in the world in the sense that it affects every, women in every uh, ethnic group, every culture, every political system, in every culture around the world affects half the population. And of course, it affects more than half the population because it affects um, all those uh, people who care about potential victims of sexual violence, which are the, the mothers, brothers, fathers, uh, uncles, etc. cetera. Um, and it also affects even the women who are not, who manage to avoid any kind of sexual violence, which from an evolutionary perspective is bypassing female choice, um, that, um, that it affects women because they have to engage in defensive behavior to avoid becoming a victim. And so it's very costly, even for those women who have not personally been victimized. So um, anyway, that's, that's really sexual violence for women is the broad umbrella uh, of the topics that I talk about in, in my new book, uh, When Men Behave Badly, because things like uh, sexual deception in the dating market, intimate partner violence, uh, stalking, uh, sexual harassment, sexual assault, all these things are things that uh, try to bypass female choice, strategies that males use to try to bypass female choice and so they all fall under this broad rubric of sexual violence toward women. Yeah, um, I was going to go uh, piecemeal through a lot of what you just said. So, uh, but that was a good re general review <laughs> of your of the whole book. Um, yeah, you do. No, you you start off and you make it very clear in the introduction of your book. You said, you, I, "My hope is that this knowledge will benefit everyone who has suffered from sexual conflict and who cares about its victims, and that it will ultimately help us to reduce the occurrence of sexual conflict and heal the harm it creates." Um, was that? I mean, I don't. I don't think that was the goal. Like when you originally went in the field. I mean, I feel like you were just interested in the science of this stuff and and understanding the truth. I uh, maybe it's somewhere along the line. It start. You started to get more interested in uh, in, in 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 the practical aspect of it. Yes. Yeah. No. That's a that's a that's a very fair characterization. That is, um, and in some ways, uh, this is something that I regret about myself. And has to do with my own uh, personal development in the field that I've uh, historically used to fancy myself as a pure scientist and, right. and kind of uh, even look down with some scorn about people who. That's the David Buss I know. That's the David right, Buss right. I, I saw at right, HBS. Right. And then I read right, this right. book and I'm like, who's this David Buss? Yeah, right, yeah. right. Well, it's, I, there's people change over time. And, yeah. and uh, I, it, it was partly in the process of doing this research and writing the book that caused this shift because I thought, well, th this is, these are major, major problems. You know, um, e even in the United States, uh, I think it's 27 to 30% of women will experience intimate partner violence. Just to take one example, 59% uh, uh, or ballpark um, will experience sexual harassment at, at some point. So, so why shouldn't the basic science inform and help to solve some of these widespread social problems? And the answer is that it should. Uh, and, and, and this is like even I've gone into, I, I'm teaching at the University of Texas now, but I think this is, occurs everywhere throughout universities. Just as an example, they have sexual harassment policies. They have sexual harassment training materials. They have a uh, college freshman orientation where they inform women. But when you go through all these materials, they're not at all informed by the, by the science of these things. And I think that, I mean, I mean I'm going to be, uh, yeah, well, I'm going to be approaching our university specifically, but uh, we're also going to be developing websites to help victims of these things, because there are a lot of misinformation out there. 
And we've done this for stalking. So with a former student of mine, Josh Dauntley, we did develop a website mm. called stalkinghelp.org, which is basically a website that contains scientific information and then practical information about where victims of stalking can go to find help. Um, uh, so, um, and ideally we'll get to the point where we have these help sites for all these things, in them apart of violence, uh, sexual harassment, sexual assault, and so forth. That's really great. If you like the kind of guests and themes we have on the Psychology Podcast, you're going to love the Jordan Harbinger Show. In each episode of Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best of 2018, Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people, from scientists and authors to athletes to mobsters, spies, and hostage negotiators. I recommend our listeners check out Jordan's conversations with physicist Michio Kaku on the quest for a theory of everything and therapist Linda Carroll on unlocking lasting love skills. Jordan's always focused on pulling useful practical insights out of his fascinating guests. And we're not talking about pop psychology or wish-washy self-help stuff here. The episodes are often loaded with bits of wisdom that you can use to legitimately change your mind and improve your life right away. It's definitely worth checking out. There are very few other podcasts to listen to casually or seriously to expand your worldview. He's also got a relatable weekly segment called Feedback Friday, where Jordan covers advice and everything from escaping a cult or psycho family situations to relationships and networking to asking for a raise. Jordan Harbinger is smart, funny, and easy to listen to. You'll be hard-pressed to find an episode without excellent conversation, a few laughs, and actionable advice that can directly improve your life. You just can't go wrong with adding the Jordan Harbinger show to your rotation. I really enjoy the show and think you will as well. There's just so much there. Check out jordanharbinger.com slash start for some episode recommendations or search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, so why are women and men so, so seemingly at odds with each other right now in this cultural moment? Um, it will, and as you would probably argue throughout the course of human evolution, but, it, but a lot of, uh, issues that maybe have, uh, been swept under the rug are coming into light more now, I would say in our cultural moment than ever before. Um, what do you think is the explanation, um, of this and, uh, you know, what are the standard explanations and then how do you think like an evolutionary approach can, can offer additional explanation? Yeah, well, so, uh, Good questions, <laughs> big questions. Yeah. So, uh, so to deal with them in the order in which you ask them, if I can remember, uh, so sexual conflict originated with the origin of uh, sexual reproduction itself. Mm. So we're talking about somewhere between a billion and two billion years ago. So sexual reproduction itself, once you have two sexes evolving and sex being defined by evolutionary biologists says the, uh, according to the size of the gametes. So the sex cells that males are defined as the ones with the small gametes, females with the large nutrient rich gametes, in the human case, sperm and egg. Uh, and, uh, and so once you have this uh, sexual reproduction, uh, it, it's uh, 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 what's optimal for the male will in certain conditions differ from what's optimal for the female. And so there's what I call this zone of conflict where you have adaptations in one sex designed to influence or manipulate the other to be closer to its optimum, and then counter adaptations in the other sex to resist those manipulations. And, and very much like predators and prey, which is a between species co-evolutionary arms race, what conflict between the sexes is, it results in what's called sexually antagonistic co-evolution which is very much analogous to the predator and prey co-evolution where it just, and it's been happening as I said, for let's say conservatively a billion years. And then, and then of course, over the entire course of human evolutionary history. And so to take one example, uh, it is often the case because females biologically invest more starting with the, the, um, the nutrient rich egg, but also with the internal female fertilization, the nine month pregnancy, lactation, et cetera, because females invest uh, obligatorily so much more than males to produce a single child. Um, it's often in female interest to be, to be very uh, choosy and discriminating and discerning about who they have sex with and who they mate with. And 
So, whereas from a male perspective, because of that minimum, minimum a lower obligatory investment, it's sometimes beneficial to initiate sex sooner, more frequently, et cetera, than is in the female's interest. And so you have this, in this example, this uh, zone of conflict where, um, uh, and it's a zone of conflict that, that results in a lot of sexual conflict. So, uh, so now your other question was, well, why, why now from a cultural standpoint, why is, why are these things uh, so prominent now? And I think that, uh, I, I mean, I don't have a definitive answer for that. I think they have become prominent at different points in our cultural evolution. So, for example, uh, it is not recently, but uh, several decades ago, that laws got changed to make marital rape rape. So it used to be the case, if you go back 30 or so years in the United States, um, rape was defined as rape of someone who was not your spouse. And it was viewed as an incoherent concept, uh, rape of spouses. It doesn't make any sense. And many countries in the world today still ha have that. It, it is literally not rape because the husband is entitled by law to sexual access to the wife's body whenever he wants in whatever way he wants. Uh, so but now there's, there's so there was a cultural shift so that in every state in the United States, marital rape is a crime and it's and it is against the law. So so these cultural shifts. So the current manifestation, like with the Me Too movement and the attention given to sexual harassment and the attention given to very prominent, high status, wealthy men who have used their status and wealth to evade uh, uh, the consequences of their uh, illegal action. So Bill Cosby, Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, and many, many others that are just, I mean, almost every week, it seems like a new one yeah. is coming, coming to light. Uh, and, and I think that, um, you know, so, so, but, but even with sexual harassment, there was a, in the 1990s, there was uh, with Clara, Clarence Thomas uh, and Anita Hill, there was a huge amount of attention to sexual harassment, and then it kind of died away. And then with the Me Too movement, uh, uh, prominent actresses coming forward, you know, and these are people who can't be dismissed, you know, uh, com coming forward and saying Harvey Weinstein did this and to so many victims. And this is one of the, and so I think that, uh, I think that it's actually very good. It's, it's uh, salutary. Some, some think that it's gone too far, but I think that uh, it has brought attention to uh, high status, high resource men who have been able to get away with these sexual crimes for many, many years. And that's one of the qualities, and I talk about this in the book to, to some extent with both sexual assault and sexual harassment, is that it's not all men who do it. Okay. It's a subset of men who have certain personality characteristics, and it's a subset of men uh, who are serial harassers and serial, serial assaulters, like Harvey Weinstein or, or Bill Cosby or Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, and women know this, but it, it hasn't received enough scientific attention. That is that women in the workplace, a new woman will come in and other women will say, oh, just be careful not to be alone with this guy because he tends to have wandering hands or, or whatever. Uh, and so it kind of highlights the fact that it, it is not all men. And what you have is a small number of men who are committing a large number of acts of sexual harassment and sexual assault. And, and that's why it's especially important to identify those men, to identify what characteristics they have, personality and mating strategy, and also the circumstances in which they're able to uh, commit these commit these crimes versus the circumstances which um, inhibit them from doing so. And, and that's one of the things that I has also been somewhat of a shift in my thinking in the book is trying more fully to integrate individual differences uh, combined with social circumstances, combined with evolved proclivities in males all to all to bear into an integrated framework to understand these uh, forms of sexual violence, and and, and that hasn't been done uh, in the past, 
at least not to a great degree. That is, that is the field of evolutionary psychology, and this has been my one of my criticisms coming out of the of an individual difference tradition, has historically ignored individual differences and focused pretty much exclusively on species typical characteristics. And that's fine, but we have to recognize how profound and important these individual differences are. Well, I co- you're, you're preaching to the choir. I completely agree. Uh, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm an individual differences researcher, and uh, that's what I try to bring to the table of evolutionary psychology in whatever yeah. contribution I made to the field. Um, I hope... Cool. Uh, it, you know, it, it uh, is the evolution. It's the um, individual differences aspect. Um, for instance, I've published papers on the evolution of intelligence. You know, why did why did the G factor evolve? You know, these kinds of questions. Um, okay, so tell me about the bad boy paradox because I I think our listeners, you know, that's what they really want to know. <laughs> they're like, why? <laughs> they're okay. All this uh, uh, mumbo jumbo. Why do I keep falling for the bad boy? You know. Um, can you talk about some of the research on the dark triad, which is an area I've uh, studied as well? And actually, I just, by the way, I just recently uh, proposed there's a light triad. So maybe we should talk about that later. But yes. uh, talk a little bit. And I think light triad people can be attractive, too. But can you can you talk a little bit about why the dark triad is so attractive? Yeah. So, well, for, first, maybe for listeners who might not know, briefly mention what the dark triad uh, are. So dark triad um uh, is uh, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy are, are the three that have been uh, called the dark triad. With narcissism, uh, just a quick hallmark of uh, a sense of entitlement, including sexual entitlement, uh, grandiosity, uh, feelings that you are so special that the rules don't apply to you, etc. Uh, psychopathy, one of the hallmarks is lack of empathy. So most humans, most of us have a empathy circuit where, you know, if someone gets harmed, if a child falls down, if a dog gets run over by a car or hit by a car, we feel this um, empathy. Um, and, and whereas uh, those low on psychop- those high on psychopathy don't, uh, they might laugh if uh, a dog gets hit. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, and, and then Machiavellianism has to do with those who pursue an exploitative social strategy. So these are cheaters, deceivers, uh, viewing view, high Mac people view others as pawns to be used and manipulated like, like pawns on a chessboard uh, for their own instrumental gains, uh, and very selfish gains. And so, uh, so you have this um, high dark triad, and when you combine it with the dispositional pursuit of a short-term mating strategy, this is a very this is a deadly combination. So, these guys who are high on dark triad, high on short term mating, are most likely to com- be the serial sexual harassers, serial sexual assaulters, etc. Now, why are some women? I would say some women, not all women, are attracted yeah. to these guys. Uh, first of all, they um, they often play a good game, so they can be very charming. Uh, they often display cues of high status. So they're, uh, uh, for example, they they take risks and uh, command the attention of the group. And that's one of the cues that we use to evaluate status is the attention structure. Uh, The high status people tend to be those to whom the most people pay the most attention. And so high dark triad people often command attention. Uh, And then the other is they are often risk taking uh, and women are attracted to risk takers, in part because those who take risks uh, engage, we take animals at their own word, so to speak. That is, those who take risks, we think, can afford to take risks. You know, if you're skydiving or, you know, motorcycle riding, that, that you that you have the physical and psychological capabilities to successfully engage in these risks without, without harm. Uh, and so there are many uh, qualities that are attractive. Okay. But these high dark triad guys are disastrous as long-term mates. They might be very exciting for short-term mating, but they're disastrous as long-term mating. They are more likely to cheat on the woman, more likely to uh, dump her, more likely to engage in multiple relationships uh, simultaneously while deceiving each one about, um, you know, who thinks that they're in a monogamous relationship. Uh, and they're very good at seduction and abandonment. 
So uh, it tends to be younger women who are most attracted to these so-called bad boys. Uh, as women experience um, some of the harms associated with being involved in bad boys and mature, uh, they tend to grow out of this being attracted to bad boy phenomenon. So, uh, so experience is sometimes very, very useful, sometimes a, a hard lesson. Mm. Now, you mentioned that, that there exists dark triad women. Uh, yes. But they have there's a different flavor to them. Like I feel like there's a different. They use different, uh, as you would say, mating strategy tactics. Yeah. Well, so high dark triad women. Uh, one of the tactics they use is they use their sexuality uh, for instrumental gains. So, for example, they might use sex um, to flirt with the boss, or even I, I actually know cases like this sleep with the boss in order to get favorable treatment. I hope you don't know about that personally. (laughs) I I know. I hope you weren't the boss. No, (laughs) no, no. no, I've never been the the boss. But no, uh, but I I know of cases in academia where uh, I know one case where a woman who was particularly high on the dark triad slept with the chair of the search committee um, and and succeeded and got the job. Uh, So um, obviously I won't mention any, any yeah. names uh, involved in this. So they, they use sexuality to get ahead, but they also engage in mate poaching. So they have no qualms, no moral qualms about sleeping with their friend's husband, for example, or boyfriend, uh, either just often for just short term um, gain uh, or in some cases trying to lure him away for a longer term relationship. So, so they're, if you ask who does the mate poaching, it's high dark triad women. High dark triad men also do that. They don't have any compunction about trying to seduce their friend's girlfriend or, or wife. So, um, so that's that's one thing. But but the high dark triad women. The reason I focus more on men than women in this case is that it is men who are engaging in the more severe forms of sexual violence toward. Uh, toward, in this case, toward women, as the men who are more likely to beat up their partners, uh, stalking, criminal stalking, 80% of the stalkers are men. Mm. And often these are stalkers have mating related motives, sexual harassment, vast majority of sexual harassers are men. Uh, and then, and then when it comes to sexual assault, of course, it's like 99% plus, uh, that are, that are men. And so, and so that's why I focus more, although I talk about dark triad women, I focus more heavily on dark triad men because they're the ones who engage in the more severe forms of sexual violence. Yeah, no, and rightly so. I, I was just wondering, uh, particularly because I, I wanted to ask, are dark triad women and dark triad men attracted to each other? Like when, like when they meet each other, do they tend to like uh, subconsciously at least uh, get attracted to each other? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that um, in terms of empirical work that's been done on it. Um, I just have anecdotal evidence because I, I know some women who are high on this dark triad. And um, uh, and characteristic of the, the high Machiavellianism of using you know exploitation as a social strategy, uh, what they tend to do is, is in, in in their in their mating is is to use like one guy for his resources, another guy to provide a kind of secure, stable backup mate, uh, you know. And so I haven't noticed in my personal observations any tendencies of dark triad women hooking up with dark triad men. But as you know, uh, assortment for similarities is one yeah. of the law, laws of mating. Uh, although for personality characteristics, that's less so. So assortment coefficients tend to be highest for intelligence and uh, political orientation and religiosity and things like that. And there is positive assortment for personality, but it's 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 at a lower level. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, you've done terrific work on what do people look for in a mate, and regardless of the personality. Um, I, I really liked, the, I like, because I'm a creativity researcher, you found that creativity is up there, you know, yes. that, what people yeah. look for in a meet and, uh, and as well as, uh, compassion. 
Um, yeah. You know, in all this dark side talk, can we, can we talk about humans have the capacity for compassion and for overriding these instincts for self-control i mean does don't men have don't some men have self-control you know yeah, they may yeah. they may have these and i know i know obviously you know you 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 would say they are they do but i think it's important in these kind of discussions to if someone is not familiar with the field and they're just listening to this stuff maybe for the first time to to just outline the naturalistic fallacy as well as um, make clear that evolutionary evolved instincts d- doesn't mean we didn't also evolve overriding, uh, you know, self control uh, functions yeah. as well. That yeah, we well, don't, absolutely, yeah. yeah, absolutely, and and even in the you know the starkest case of this in my own research has to do with homicidal ideation or homicidal mm-hmm. fantasies which most people have had at one point or another, but most people don't go out and kill. And, you know, it's very, very statistically extremely rare. And I think actually that's one of the functions of scenario building of this sort is to inhibit that because people have a homicidal fantasy, usually about someone who's wronged them in some profound way. In the case of women, it's guys who have raped them. They have homicidal fantasies about these, uh, these guys. Uh, but the scenario building that people do when they experience homicidal ideation all, almost invariably leads to the conclusion that, no, this is not a good strategy to pursue. It's not a good way to solve the problem. And so I think it actually does serve that inhibitory function, which may seem ironic to some that, that homicidal fantasy is actually an inhibitory mechanism, you know, uh, in most cases. So but the other issue, so, so I, I agree with you totally. We. We, we, we have to have these self-control mechanisms and also uh, superordinate mechanisms. So just as it's like if we, we have a desires for uh, calorically rich food that might be bad for us, if we're trying to lose weight or if we're trying to eat healthfully, uh, we might override those evolved taste preferences for a different goal, you know, uh, for a, a more healthy goal. And so we, we have to, uh, we have different underlying desires, goals, and motives at any one point in time. And so we have to uh, sequence that, suppress some, allow, you know, uh, circumstances to dictate which ones get expressed when uh, and so forth. But importantly, I think there are profound individual differences in this. And so the, like an example, there are some actors, as you know, who have been um, called out for sexual harassment, in some cases, sexual assault. But you think like on the LARP, uh, light triad issue, like Tom Hanks as an actor, could you imagine him engaging in this bad behavior? And I think the answer yeah. is no, you would predict he's, 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 he would never do that. You know, he just doesn't, uh, likely doesn't have those impulses that need to be inhibited to begin with. Right. And so, uh, well, so I think that you, know, you never yeah. know what he, he probably has yeah. freaky yeah. fantasies, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, no, I hear, I, I hear you. I, I get your point. Um, I think it's just uh, just a meta comment on the field. Reading your book, there's such a there's a whole lexicon of it's like you a whole different language, you know, that you calling these things. You know, you have got meat poaching, then you got meat insurance, <laughs> you got you got. I mean, uh, you know, all these you know strategies, tactics. It's it's. I mean, you're so ensconced in it, David. I mean, you you've worked in this field for how many years? These terms and, but like for the general public, like. It's it's really actually getting up to speed on a whole new language. Yeah, yeah well, and I and I think that uh, yeah yeah well, thank you for pointing that out. I mean, the, the term bait poaching didn't exist until I, I think I was the first one who used it mm. uh, back in '94. But um, but the thing is, it, it requires a new lexicon, a new scientific lexicon, because many of these phenomena have not been studied before. So so even like with a, another, take a slightly different example. Uh, mate retention. So in the insect uh, or in non-human animal mating literature, there's the term mate guarding. So which is what a lot of male insects do. They mate guard. They try to get the female and guard her, prevent other males. Uh, but when I started studying this, uh, guarding seemed too d- narrow a term. And so I use the term mate retention because in long-term mating, it's not just the physical guarding, that, but it's also things like the lighter things like providing a mate 
with with uh, resources or benefits or trying to embody uh, do things that that satisfy your mate's desires that are part of mate retention and these are don't really neatly fall under the narrow category of mate guarding and so that's why I think a a novel uh, scientific lexicon is is in many cases warranted here so yeah fair enough. Um, just to just to close the uh, circle on the uh, bad boy paradox, um, I wrote a book with Glenn Gear called uh, "Meeting Intelligence Unleashed," and yeah. uh, and I uh, really looked into that whole literature on bad boys, the evolution of psychology, of bad boys. I have a whole chapter on that. My reading of the of the literature in total, and my own attempt at a synthesis, is that uh, you know women like these uh, tender defenders, you know. Um, it's not that they actually like the asshole. It's that the asshole traits sometimes come along for the ride. Um, or not only that, but, um, you know, they'll like, uh, someone who, you know, is, has a very strong personality that can defend them, you know, that, that will stand up for them, will protect them, you know? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so it's not, it's not exactly that they, are attracted to the asshole traits, but right. it's just that some of these kinds of, you know, aspects, uh, these characteristics, um, can very easily turn into assholery behavior. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, that, that's fair enough. And, um, yeah, that, I, it's a, it's a very cool book. Uh, I like that whole, Thanks. that whole idea of mating intelligence. In fact, I, uh, I think it was, yeah, Glenn, um, edited a, a book or uh, this was like there was one that was kind of for a more um, yeah meeting intelligence audience. with jeffrey yeah. miller yeah and then and then i this is when i was in grad school i reached out to glenn and i said hey you don't know me but i this is one of my first books i ever i, I ever written, wrote i said hey glenn do you want to write a popular book with me about that because i loved it i actually wrote a chapter in that edited book on humor the role okay. of humor and mate selection yeah. i wrote that with jeffrey miller um, and yeah, and Glenn and I turned it into a popular book afterwards. Yeah. 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 yeah very cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, one, one other thing I just wanted to, to loop back to, uh, the topic of in, inhibition yeah. and, um, uh, self-control mechanisms. And, and this has to do with one of the, what I think is the, one of the most important sex differences, which is I've mentioned is the desire for sexual variety. So, and, and men just have on average, higher levels of this. They desire a larger number of partners after less time has elapsed and so forth. So men can walk down a city block uh, and spot half a dozen women over the course of just a few minutes and have sexual attraction to the to those women. Now, if all of those desires were expressed in manifest behavior, we would live in a crazy, chaotic um anarchic 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 and violent um uh culture and we, and we don't and, and and in fact most men inhibit the even if they're trying to attract a woman for a short-term sexual encounter they inhibit the the direct expression of their sexual interest for that short-term goal that is they often deceptively give off long-term signals they, they give off uh, nice guy signals, high investment signals, high commitment signals, high emotional involvement signals uh, in order to achieve a short term mating goal. And so and so even in the service of short term mating, men often inhibit the expression of their uh, the sexual desires that they have. It's just called acting cool, man. <laughs> that's it yeah, yeah be cool don't be don't be so like you know don't come across so needy what do yeah. you um uh wh- how do you feel about the fact that you have a whole cottage industry of so-called pickup artists who are using your book um and the main principles of evolutionary psychology to seduce women and sometimes you know trick them how do you feel about that well, well, I, I've looked into this and I've, I've had conversations with people in that community, in the pickup artist community, and I think there's, there's a whole range. Uh, so there are some, like on the, what I would say on the better side, that are, that are tr- trying to train men uh, just to be better quality men, uh, better quality mates in order to attract women. And so there's like, and that's, you know, moves sort of honest courtship 
and improving your value as a mate. And then at the other end, you have the, the sort of um, deceptive, smarmy, underhanded tactics, uh, which, which of course I think I find ab abhorrent. Uh, so, um, so you, so you have the whole range there, just like you have the range of scientists, you have the whole range of pickle artists, but I, I'm not sure that, uh, I mean, I know that they occasionally cite my book. Um, I haven't looked into them enough to know whether they cite it accurately or not. Like, so like this whole concept of, uh, negging, for example, like that, the, the way to, you know, you kind of like try to undermine the woman's self-esteem and, uh, as a way of displaying your high status. I, I don't, I don't see that as, uh, uh, anchored in any way in evolutionary psychology. Yeah. I, I don't know what the evolutionary basis for nagging is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, other than a motivation to Machiavellianism to other than that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I did bring up the naturalistic fallacy earlier, but I think it's really, really important for us to define that oh. for people who've never heard of it. Um, it, it kind of the naturalistic fallacy, like an understanding that really can quell a lot of criticisms of the field, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, there, there are multiple fallacies. There's, there's the, you know, the, um, if it exists, then it ought to exist. So the is ought fallacy, mm -hmm. uh, which is, of course is not, um, uh, which is a fallacy because it's like if you, um, and it gets back to an earlier point that we discussed about if you study a phenomenon, that means somehow you endorse it. So the example I use in the book is like, if you're a cancer researcher, you're trying to study cancer to eliminate it or cure it. Uh, you're not studying it because you think cancer is a great thing and you want to promote it. Uh, and so I think the same is true here. I think that, uh, people, also, uh, getting back to the naturalistic fallacy, think that uh, if something h has evolved, then it must be a good thing. Um, uh, and then a related one is that if it evolved, you can't change it. So that what I call the intractability fallacy. And so I think if you, uh, and that's why in the book, I, I, I hope I take great pains on to, uh, and I did this actually going back to the very first book that I wrote, uh, trying to dispel some of these myths, but they're very, they're very per persistent. Uh, so even after people have been exposed to these fallacies, they still tend to commit them, you know, so even intelligent professors that I talked to, have, mm. you know, explain X evolved and they think, oh, well, therefore we're doomed not to change it. Uh, uh no. Um, I think that in the case of sexuality, it, I think it's more difficult to change evolved desires than it is to change their expression and behavior, getting back to that inhibition point. So you, you might not be able to change men's attraction to novel women uh, who have certain cues, but you can change their expression of that uh, their sexual desires in behavior, uh, like for example, in the workplace where it's inappropriate to, uh, express those sexual desires. Um, and that's really what sexual harassment laws and policies are all about is trying to inhibit those. So, um, uh, you know, and, and if I didn't think change was possible, I, I, I wouldn't have written this book. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, it, getting back to that earlier point that we talked about, I think these, uh, everybody would agree these are bad things, intimate partner violence, sexual harassment, sexual assault, and that we want to eliminate them and a deeper understanding of their causes, the, the men who do these things, the conditions under which they do them is critical to eliminating their occurrence. So that was probably a more long winded answer than you wanted for the naturalistic fallacy. What are your thoughts on the naturalistic fallacy? Oh, I think it's very important for uh, people to recognize that nature um, and our and our selfish genes are not necessarily um, in our the best interest of the whole organism. You know, yeah. like my own research is on um, well-being and self-actualization of um, our highest potential. 
you know, and it's sometimes reading some of this evolution of psychology literature, it feels like we're far away away from our, from the high, we're talking about the highest potential <laughs> of humans. You know, you open up a, you know, uh, an evolution, an, evo- an evolution of psychology textbook, like your textbook. And it's like the greatest hits of the dark side, you know? And, uh, that's why I really like, um, uh, Glenn Gear's uh, new work in positive evolutionary psychology. I actually wrote the foreword yeah. to his new book, um, mm-hmm. that he, he wrote on positive evolutionary psychology. Uh, with Nicole Wedman, I believe. Yeah. 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 So, and uh, yeah, I agree. And I I like his work as well, but wouldn't you agree that, um, that, uh, okay. So here, here's the way I would put it. So every human has a limited time and energy budget and we have to allocate our time and energy to different Mm. endeavors. And, the fact that there are these dark sides, that women experience sexual violence, unwanted sexual attention, et cetera, means they have to allocate time and energy to dealing with those and fending them off and grappling with them. And so eliminating some of those, these darker phenomena would free up time and energy to devote to the more positive aspects uh, of, of positive psychology. I completely agree. I mean, that's uh, that's why I um, I think of it in terms of a hierarchy of needs perspective. Um, yeah, that's uh, you know my 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 new book on uh, is on uh, you know I revised Maslow's hierarchy of needs and I try to put a lot of it on an evolutionary foundation, and mm-hmm. um, and the the whole you know like like chapter one is all about. Um, all the, you know, deprivations and when you live in um, environments that are harsh and unpredictable, you know, that causes our um, our focus to go right towards that and uh, and activate certain evolutionary instincts that really hold us back from self-actualization. So I think we're right there on the same page. I think the, the dark side and the light side, though, that those research literatures need to be integrated, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah, that we can absolutely. have a, a fuller picture of what humans could be, I guess. That's what I would so what, so so on that what is your view of the the light side the light triad is it just the opposite of the dark no. triad or is it it has it's different, different. Ele- elements we we went into it with the research uh, question is the light side just simply the reverse coded items of the dark side and we found um, empirically that no in fact it, there's a 0.5 correlation uh, it's not, we're not talking, we're not saying that everyone who has low dark triad traits will necessarily have high light triad traits, you know, um, no. uh, it's something else. And, uh, the three aspects we discovered, um, are, uh, Kantianism, uh, which was our cheeky, uh, reversal of Machiavellianism, which is, uh, no. c- you know, constant categorical imperative, you know, is treat people as ends unto themselves. Uh, not means as an ends, not means to an ends. Um, but humanism was a new one, a new facet that wasn't just me- merely the reverse coded, um, treating every individual with uh, dignity, worth, and respect. Um, and faith in humanity, um, which is, do you have a general orientation in the world that you think that at heart humans are basically good, a kind of a worldview? Um, and we found these three uh, really uh, cohere together to this uh, higher order factor. Okay. Yeah. Okay, very cool. I just had my own curiosity, and maybe listeners would be interested in this as well. So I, I was uh, friends with Chris Peterson, who was one of the founders of the positive psychology movement, yeah. and unfortunately passed away early. Uh, but he had these, uh, I think, uh, 24 character traits. Uh, do, what? How does your, do, does his system hold up, or was he uh, overextending or, or didn't have a solid empirical basis? Given what you know now about the the light triad, like how does no. how do you view this compared yeah. to his system? Yeah, so we actually looked at the correlation between the light triad and uh, and all of the character strengths, um, the twenty four that that Chris Peterson and Martin Seligman proposed, and um, you know that that research holds up quite well. You you there you can actually go on the VIA character strengths uh, survey website and take the test and find out your character strengths. The point is that people who score high in the light triad tend to be very oriented towards this particular class of character strengths, which are self-transcendent um, character uh, strengths. So love, um, uh, wisdom, they tend to be behind wisdom, gratitude, um, hope, uh, and, uh, and uh, th- you know, things that are very compassion oriented. Um, so, you know, there are better, better angels of human nature, right? That, yes, yeah. that, that exists alongside 
what you've studied uh, right. predominantly right. in your career. Right. I think that uh, you've done a, a great service. I mean, you're you're a legend in the field, and um, I, I just, uh, you know, I want this us to be able to integrate into a, a full picture of what humans are and what they could be, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you for that, and I, I think it's a, it's a worthy goal and important to recognize that what has evolved in humans is this whole spectrum of uh, of adaptations, of psychological adaptations, some of which are, you know, nasty and brutish, and some of which are benevolent, altruistic, cooperative, benefit conferring, et cetera. And, um, and we have to recognize that we, each of us have, have all of these within us uh, to some degree. Uh, and, uh, and it's not just, so that's why sort of painting human nature as either sort of intrinsically purely good and corrupted by civilization and bad parenting and bad cultures or humans as intrinsically bad and have to be, you know, tame. Both of views are wrong. I mean, we have this whole collection of adaptations that vary in their functions, uh, valence and the degree to which they're expressed. And, and I'm all for uh, suppressing the nasty ones and bringing out the better angels of our nature. Well, that came through loud and clear, David, in your, in your new book. I'm really glad that you're moving in this direction. I really am. Um, the world needs it right now. Um, thanks so much for coming on my podcast today, David, and, and all the best with the, the rest of your book tour. Well, thank you. Thank you. And it's been great talking to you and uh, intellectually enlightening and informative for me and, and hopefully for your audience. Likewise, and I'm sure it will be. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, if you'd prefer a completely ad-free experience, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.